by the way, I recommend taking nine-year-olds wherever you are in whatever field of science you're in. It's, it's done a lot for me. When you look at this environment out there in the cradle of humankind, and I'm sure many, many of you are familiar with it, I think probably most people who are not scientists like myself or geologists, they see a sort of beautiful rolling landscape that is the remarkable thing that we have right on the outskirts of the second largest metropolitan area in sub-Saharan Africa. I see a great big block of Swiss cheese and one that has a great deal of potential. Because when I look at that landscape, what I see is a network of caves underneath it. It is, of course, karstic dolomites that, that run through that area. And along the fault lines, these caves form. Now, not all of them are probably what this audience or the public would call caves in the way that you might think the Sturkfontein caves are caves. Most of them are networks of fissures and small chambers that that are not as perhaps easy to access as, as you might imagine. It's not just walking down a stairway into a large chamber. I'd done a lot of that work back in the 90s. I'd, re I'd originally, in my first exploration activities, had tried underground work, but there was a mythology, or at least an idea at that time, that the things that were underground were going to be too young to be of interest. They were in the modern case. Where we wanted to look would be in the eroded older caves, which were now exposed to the surface. Keep in your mind, a malapa. Keep in your mind, the idea of Sturkfontein. They are ancient cave fills that have now eroded down and are exposed. That's where your ancient ones are. New stuff is going to be in these new caves. And I certainly didn't find a lot. Uh, it was at this time, now mid-2013, I'm locked out of Malapa, that I decided I wanted to get back out and do some exploring. But I wanted to go underground now. I don't want to just repeat what I'd done in 2008, walking across the surface. Um, and it was at that moment that a coincidence occurred, one of those wonderful scientific coincidences. A pirate walked into my office. Um, that's Pedro. He was, a former, he was a former student of mine. He'd been a master's student of mine, and then he got it in his head to go uh, diamond mining up in Central Africa or something like that, and had not surprisingly lost everything. And he literally walked into my office barefoot and destitute. And with tears in his eyes, he said, please, give me an opportunity. You know, give me a chance to get back into the thing I love, which is paleoanthropology. <laughs> and one of the coincidences of that was that Pedro and I had caved together. When he was a student, he was a significant caver. And I said, well, you know what? Let's do it. But let's go underground this time. And that was when the greatest miracle of the story I'm telling you occurred. And I think those of you, most of this room is some way associated with academia or has been. The greatest miracle of this story happened. I convinced the University of the Wittwaterstrand to let me buy a motorcycle. <laughs> it, had to be, it had to be white, it had to be, of course. And so that I could, at a low budget, literally pulling a budget out of what I had, send Pedro out into the sort of wilderness. But I said, here are the rules. I don't want you to just go randomly out there and just chase all those holes that I found. I want you to start in the places we know the best. Because I'd learned something from Malapa. Malapa was one kilometer away from where I'd spent the last 17 years, side of Glasgow. So I want you to start in the Sturkfontein Valley. Because that's where we know this place the best. Every scientist worth his salt has worked there. It's the longest running sites in the world. Since the 1930s, we have been intensively at particularly three sites there. Of course, Crom Dry, Sturkfontein, and, and Swartkrons. And so he did. Well, very quickly, though, Petro realized that perhaps like me, time had passed, and he was not perhaps as physiologically appropriate as he used to be <laughs> to go into some of these deeper chambers and deeper caves that, that existed in this area. And so he went to the local caving club and found two amateur cavers. One, an accountant, Steve Tucker, who was physiologically appropriate, and Rick Hunter, who was a sort of jobbing workman who had was a Mensa member who had flunked out, been thrown out of high school after blowing up his chemistry lab. And they were 
physiologically appropriate to get into these cave systems, and clearly crazy enough to do so, but they're my crazy. And so off they went. They, of course, looked at all the new places that I had found back in 2008 first, because new is better, right? The places you haven't been and don't know are the places you want to go first. Finally, after moving through that area and thinking that they had covered it fairly well and seen casts and stuff of what we were looking for, one evening, around September 13th, they went into the best-known cave site, not only in this region, but perhaps in all of South Africa, a place called the Rising Star System. Rising Star System is right across the road from Swartkrons, a kilometer and a half from Sturkfontein, and every single amateur caver probably in this country has been in there in the last 50 years because it's used as a training cave. It's completely well mapped. And in exploring on that night, they found a place which, if any of you have followed this story, was called Dragon's Back, which is a series of collapses that climbed up. And there, Steve and Rick looked down a little hole, a shaft, literally a shaft, that was 17 and a half centimeters wide. I want you to keep that in your mind. That mind. They look down into the darkness. And then, as Steve is doing here, they slipped feet first down into that shaft. Now get an idea of looking at the narrowness of that shaft. And you can see how if Steve does not turn his head, his helmet will not fit. Down they went 12 meters through this narrow vertical chimney. Sharp rocks. And instead of it opening up into a large chamber and then falling to their death, they actually came out into a small chamber that dropped the last two and a half meters. A clay dirt covered the floor, and immediately they saw small bits of bone on the ground. As they moved into the chamber, it was clear that perhaps someone else had been there before. Some material had been stacked up on a rock. Pieces had been broken there were some white breaks on the bone. And as they looked at this stuff, they thought, gosh, that looks a lot like the stuff Lee and Pedro are asking us to look for. Pulled out the camera, and it didn't work. <laughs> out they came. They called Pedro, called me, and said, we think we might have found something, but I think for anyone in science, you know, people like me get those calls all the time, you know. We found a dinosaur in our backyard, and it's a plastic baby doll head or something like that. Um, and I said, you know, bring me pictures. And I forgot about it. They couldn't go in for a little over a week again. And I was at home, October 1st, 2013, sitting at night, working on the Internet, talking to people, my colleagues in the United States, and my front buzzer went, my gate buzzer. And I picked up the intercom. This is Joburg, you know, there's always a... <laughs> I said, hello, and it was Pedro, and he went, you're going to want to let us in, in a creepy voice just like that. <laughs> and I almost didn't. It is Joburg, after all, at 9 o'clock at night, but I did, and I let him in, and we opened up, it's, Steve was with him, we opened up the laptop, and there I saw pictures that I thought I would never see in my entire career. This was the first one. I knew immediately what that was. That was a hominid mandible. Not only just a hominid man, well, I could see by the proportions and size of the teeth that it was a primitive hominid. This was not a human. It stunned me because it's just lying there. For any of you who have followed this field of science, you don't find fossil hominids in South Africa just lying there like that. That skull that you saw of Sadiba took 20,000 preparation hours to get to that state, seen in solid rock. The teeth looked enormous to me. I mean, okay, I know that I could probably, I'm probably someday going to get in trouble with this because if you read carefully, science says, the little measuring tape says, for home sewing aid only. They're misusing it. <laughs> but it looked to me like the teeth were enormous based on that. Next slide showed multiple limb bones that for anyone trained in this field, you knew that these two were hominid. Most remarkably, the next picture along, a skull. There it is. You see that curved area there sitting in dirt. Unbelievable. We celebrated a little bit. I sent them home. And then I couldn't sleep. 
And so, 2 a.m., I picked up the phone because I was worried. I could see that someone had broken some fossils and Stephen Rick swore that was not them. I knew this cave. I had been in this cave in the 90s. Not that chamber, but this system. Everyone knew about it. And it was the first time in my career I'd ever enlisted amateurs in the exploration process. And I was pretty sure the word was going to be spreading that Lee was excited about something that was found. And I decided I needed to move relatively quickly, weighing in all those factors. I hadn't got through my mind what 17 and a half centimeter slot meant, but picked up the phone to a dear old friend and colleague of mine, Terry Garcia, who's vice president, well, he's now, actually now chief science and exploration officer at National Geographic. And I said, Terry, you need a computer. I showed him a couple of these pictures, and I explained the background as I've explained it to you, and I said, you know, if you're ever going to believe in me, believe in me now. That's explorer speak for I need money. <laughs> he paused for a moment, and he said, Lee, do what you need to do. That's Grant for saying, okay, but don't spend too much. <laughs> and I hung up the phone, and I got cold feet, because now I just risked my entire reputation on a photograph with a home sewing aid only tape and something I'd never seen. But I did know that I would never go down a 17 and a half centimeter slot. I couldn't. I won't fit. And no jokes about my head being too big. So I did know someone who could go down a 17 and a half centimeter uh, slot that I trusted implicitly. My now then 15 year old son, Matthew, who's now six foot four, but that wide. And so I worked with my scientific cameras and some scales, and I taught him how to take these pictures, and because I'm going for father of the year, we crawled into that cave system. I climbed Dragon's Back with Steve and Rick, a, almost a 45-minute journey in 100% humidity, 40 meters underground, to the top of this slot, looked down into that darkness, and there I sent Matthew, Steve, and Rick down. And I sat there in the dark, sending my son to his death. I sat there planning how...